Well, hello, everybody. This is Randy Welsh, the Executive Director for the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. We're thankful that you came to join us today for our Wilderness Challenge webinar series. Today, we have an esteemed panel from the long distance trails community talking to us about working with long distance trail organizations in wilderness. So we are going to allow time for each of our panelists to um, make some opening remarks as they do introductions about their individual trail. Then we'll have a round robin about some other questions pertinent to the, the use and engagement of volunteers and other um, information about the long distance trails that we hope that you'll find very informative and educational. And uh, then we'll allow time at the end of the presentation for questions um, and answers. If you do have questions during the presentation, please just use the question tab on your GoToMeeting webinar dashboard and type it in and we will respond to those as um, we go through and we'll respond to those at the end of the, the webinar. If you have any technical questions with the GoToMeeting platform, please just use the chat function direct it to uh, staff or myself and we'll take a look and try to help you out as we go along with the presentation and we did have so some with, um, they're having trouble hearing so if you guys can use the questions tab real quick to let us know if you can hear or not that would be great okay so we should be good thank you okay we'll make sure we speak into our microphones and um, Talk clearly and distinctly. Okay, so with no further ado, we're going to go ahead and get started. If we can figure out the lag. There we go. All right, so our esteemed panel today we have Andrew Downs from the Appalachian Trail Conservancy, Teresa Martinez from the Continental Divide Trail Coalition, Jennifer Tripp from the Pacific Crest Trail Association, and Chelsea Bodmar from the Partnership for the National Trail System. And I probably messed up your last name there, Chelsea, but sorry sure. about that. <laughs> it's Bodemer. So yeah, Bodemer. So we're going to start with um, Andrew, who's going to tell us a little bit about the Appalachian Trail. Andrew, go ahead and take it away. Actually, before sure. it starts, what I'll do, um, I believe the first slide talks a little bit about the National Trail System, so I can give you all a brief history um, and background on the National Trail System as a, a point of reference for the webinar today. Yeah, so please do. Sorry about that, Chelsea. It's okay. <laughs> this is our last minute edition. So, um, yeah, so the National Trail System Act was signed into or was signed by Linda B. Johnson on October 2nd, 1968. So there are four components to the National Trail System: the National Scenic Trails, the National Historic Trails, National Rec Trails, and the Rail Trails. And so the National Scenic and Historic Trails, there's over 55,000 miles of. Um, up until this year, they went through 49 states, but we can officially say, say that they go through all 50 states now. With the, well. With Senate Bill 47, so once it gets signed by the president, um, the National Scenic and Historic Trails will go through all 50 states. The National Rec Trails, there's more than uh, 1,200 trails, and they run more than 2,600, I'm sorry, 26,000 miles through all 50 states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. And the rail trails, there's 22,000 miles of, with 80,000 or 8,000 miles of projects in progress. And there are more than 2,000 rail trails that exist in 50 states today. And these trails, um, all of these trails call for the involvement of volunteers and the management, protection, and maintenance of them. And Chelsea, the announcement for that bill signing just came through, I think, minutes ago. Oh, hooray! <laughs> awesome. Thank you for sharing. No problem. All right. All right. Well, thank you, Chelsea. So let's go ahead and start with Andrew on the Appalachian Sea National Scenic Trail, common, lovingly called the AT. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Randy. And thanks, Chelsea. Appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak with everyone today. Uh, I'm, 
I hope most, if not everyone, has heard of the AT. Um, ATC was founded in uh, 1924 to facilitate the construction, uh, the exploration and construction of the AT. And I won't get too far into the history, um, but today our mission is to preserve the AT and the experiences and renewal and fellowship found therein. Um, and we have a decentralized management approach we call the uh, cooperative management system that um, works with 31 delegated trail clubs from Georgia to Maine, the uh, Park Service, the Forest Service, the other 84 separate land management agencies that, um, that partner protect the AT and the ATC, which is generally in a facilitation, coordination, and um, most importantly, an empowerment role. So we try to empower that partnership and make sure that volunteers are at the forefront of AT management. Uh, our 31 trail clubs are not chapters. We are kind of a confederation of independent organizations that come together uh, to preserve, protect, and manage the AT. Um, and those organizations, the 31 de uh, designated trail club, range in size from um, medium-sized clubs with small chunks of trail, one or two miles, um, big clubs with big chunks of trail, like the Appalachian Mountain Club, which is actually larger than the uh, ATC, and then really small uh, trail clubs with small sections of trail um, based across the 14 AT states. Um, generally, they're all separate 501c3s, although some may not be incorporated, um, but we don't, um, we don't have any sort of management responsibility internal to those clubs. They're independent completely. Um, but we also work with organizations like uh, the Backcountry Horsemen of America. We work with um, a, a, a myriad of other partner organizations in uh, just state governments and things like that to make sure that um, the AT is open, safe, and, and well protected. Um, we have a, a range of projects we work with local stewardship groups on. And they range from your standard trail construction or trail maintenance project that, uh, that um, a lot of folks are probably familiar with to um, bringing information to Congress, um, advocating for the trail or, or bills that um, preserve and protect the AT. And we also work with our local trail clubs on management um, issues. I think one of the more recent ones we worked on uh, was in my region here in Virginia was a shelter on the AT that was also in wilderness and the shelter had been um, uh, the immediate area had been subject to a huge uh, gypsy moth kill off so we had hundreds of trees that were dead standing and created dangerous uh, environment around that overnight shelter so we went through a process of evaluating you know do we need the shelter and it's wilderness and the AT and the shelter predate the wilderness uh, designation. So it was a, a, a pretty uh, involved conversation and the volunteers um, took a lead role there, uh, which was uh, which was exciting. Um, and we offer a, a range of training at ATC, um, whether that's technical training on trail work or trail skills to how to approach um, elected officials with uh, advocacy, um, how to, you know, what is a, a minimum requirements analysis, you know, just all sorts of different things. And in general, we provide those on an as needed basis. So um, we advertise opportunities uh, to the clubs and say, if you need anything, uh, please let us know. Um, so we can kind of tailor a suite of trainings to our clubs and partners. Um, so that's a little bit about the Appalachian Trail Conservancy in a nutshell. Um, we are headquartered in Harpers Ferry and have four regional offices spread across uh, the East Coast. And that's us. Great, thank you, Andrew. Let's no problem. Let's go ahead and have, have Teresa from the Continental Divide Trail. Great, hi everyone. Um, this is Teresa Martinez. <clears throat> And I'm calling to you from, or I'm actually calling in um, from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Actually, we're 
doing a lot of our uh, work right now to get down to the southern monument of the CDT. And so it's um, that probably will tell you a little bit about the work that we do. Um, the Continental Divide Trail Coalition was formed in 2012, and we are based in Golden, Colorado. But like the ATC and PCTA, we have responsibility for the entire CDT from Mexico to Canada. And so because of that, we have folks placed in Helena, Montana and Silver City, New Mexico, as well as um, people sprinkled in Leadville, Colorado, and soon to be uh, somewhere in Northern New Mexico as well. We have 10 full-time staff, we have over 2000 members, and um, our staff mostly deal with, um, we have a lot of programs, we have your standard field programs that run all of our volunteer projects, um, do a lot of data collection on the trails condition that we then help support with our federal agencies to get them that data and information that they need to, to manage the trail. Um, unlike the AT and maybe even the PCT, I'm not sure, Jen will talk about that. Um, for the CDT, up until 2012, we didn't even have an official map set for the CDT because so much of it was incomplete. So CDTC, a lot of our work is, is, is around getting just the base data and knowledge um, for the CDT documented through GIS and then utilized through the Forest Services data um, uh, program, the, either the TRED, TRED database or other kinds of resources um, so that we actually have data to manage the trail, not just from the from the actual what do we need in wilderness areas and trail maintenance but where what's our view shed what's our scenery like we haven't done any of that work so we're starting to build that data um that database and also that just base level of knowledge about the trail and its nationally significant resources um so we do we do like i said we have programs that run those field programs we also have a program that's very vibrant in working with our local communities called our gateway community program we also provide all the information um, and resources to the public on how to access the CDT. So we have a free downloadable map set, a free planning guide, and a whole host of information that people can utilize from our website, um, it, done in partnership and cooperation with our lead agency, the Forest Service. Um, <clears throat> we do have volunteers this year that are gonna be doing a lot more GIS collection, and actually we're gonna start looking at um, one of the things that's unique to the CDT is up until about four or five years ago, we only had maybe 25 through hikers on the CDT. A lot of, you know, section hikers and people visiting specific sections along the CDT because it does co-align with things like the Colorado Trail in central Colorado, but also it goes up, up and over Grays and Torrey's Peaks, um, as well as it goes through the four national parks, Glacier, Yellowstone, or three national parks, Glacier, Glacier Yellowstone, and Rocky Mountain National Park, um, and then the El Monte East National Monument. But those other three national parks are very heavily used. And I, um, so along those lines, we're going to start collecting some baseline campsite information where we have only dispersed camping along the CDT, but we're starting to notice now with almost 400 through hikers that they're starting to create some minor impacts. So we're trying to get ahead of the game there. Um, so we're using some volunteers to collect some GIS data this year to do that. Um, most of our work is in leveraging partnerships with other partners because we're so small and we're based mostly in Golden, Colorado. We try to lever lever leverage our relationships with like uh, Montana Wilderness Association volunteers for Alta Colorado, Colorado Trail Foundation, New Mexico volunteers or volunteers outdoors, New Mexico, I can never get them right. Um, so that we, we sort of really try to strengthen the things, we, strength, we, we maximize our strengths so that we can focus on really the CDT and then we leverage those relationships with other partners to help support them doing a lot of the other work that they're already doing on the CDT, but um, helping coordinate that through our lens so that it really meets the needs um, for our federal agencies. Last year, um, again, as I mentioned in 2007 or 11 and 12, we didn't even have a map set. Last year, we actually completed a two year effort to sign the entire CDT for the first time ever, um, which we did. And so now the CDT is officially signed from Mexico to Canada. And it was a, a two year process that we engaged with four service account crews, force account crews, youth corps, other volunteer organizations and our own volunteers and it was a really coordinated effort that we sort of worked with um, our lead agency partner, the Forest Service, to do in a way that we created a signing guide that became the standard operating procedure um, that all of our various components, all the various partners used 
um, as a way of, of really codifying how we're going to mark and sign the trail, whether that's in or outside of wilderness, are we going to use cairns, are we going to use actual signs, and we created sort of a whole standard way of doing that. But that's significant because now that we have the trail signed, um, not only can people not maybe not get as lost as they typically do on the CDT, um, it helps us also look at other things next. So we knew signing was a big part of the work that we needed to do and making sure that that was consistent. And then I would just mention that we are continually working with all of our partners, um, our agency partners to really coordinate and figure out those next things that we need to do. And for us, as I mentioned, some of that stuff is because we have such low use on the CDT right now, um, save for a few areas. Um, we're in a really great place to sort of learn from the other trails, such as the AT and the PCT, on how to prevent some of the issues that they're facing um, now so that other issues that crop up, we can at least, we're sort of a little bit of ahead of the game. We know we have a lot of work to do, but it helps us sort of apply some of the learning that we have from other trails. And as they have seen their use increase, um, thinking about how we want to sort of mitigate some of those um, potential issues now. And the only other thing I'll mention is the CDT goes through five states. We go through four regions of the Forest Service. Uh, again, three national parks, one national monument, three BLM resource management areas. And, um, and I think we're only beginning to see the increased use on the CDT. So this year we're expecting 400 through hikers. But to the other extreme, um, because the CDT goes over places, um, a lot of the 14ers, we've also know that like at Gray's and Torrey's Peaks last year saw 20,000 visitors on a five mile section of CDT. So we know we have use that we have to address. We know some of those areas aren't just in wilderness, they are in really high um, access, or areas that are easy to access and in general forest areas. Um, but we also know we have these other nationally significant resources that the trail accesses and we're, we're trying to figure out how best to do that from not just a long distance um, trail focus, but all these sort of destination point focus and management um, uh, paradigms as well. So with that, I'll turn it over to Jen. All right, thank you very much, uh, Teresa. Lots of coordination going on on the Continental Divide Trail. All right, so our third long distance trail is the Pacific Crest Trail. So, Jen, would you like to talk about it? I think that's forwarded to, let's see what's going on here. There we go. Thanks, Randy. Again, I'm Jennifer Tripp. I'm the Director of Trail Operations for Pacific Crest Trail Association. We're based out of Sacramento, California. Um, the trail goes through three states. You can see it here on the map. The mission of our organization is to preserve, protect, and promote the Pacific Crest Trail. So we do things um, like issue permits, long distance hiker permits. Um, of the big three trails, we're the one trail that uh, you do need a permit to travel more than 500 miles. So we do that on behalf of the federal government, the Forest Service, the Park Service, and the Bureau of Land Management. We also have a very strong advocacy program. So we advocate for legislation and funding with, the, with US Congress. Um, we work on land conservation and acquisition to protect the trail and the corridor and the view shed um, so that we can maintain a really wilderness primitive experience to the greatest extent possible. It is a little challenging in Southern California to do that, but we still work toward, towards doing that. Um, but by far our biggest program that we have is our stewardship program, and that's our volunteer maintenance and working with core crews and other partner organizations to do actual trail maintenance. And now more and more we're doing more visitor use management with partners. Um, and so I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, you can see the stats for our trail on the screen. We do go through a lot of different agency units. Um, so uh, much like the AT and the CDT, um, we're coordinating. We serve as a coordinator. Um, we can't do this work alone. We work with all of um, those agencies, and federal and state, but also a number of partners. Um, so of the 2,200 volunteer and core members that we had last year, we worked with ACE, American Conservation Experience, NYC, Northwest Youth Corps, WCC, which is Washington Conservation Corps. Um, and then we also work with other partner organizations like Washington Trails Association, the Tahoe Rim Trail, High Sierra Volunteer Trail Crew. Those partners provide um, either adopt sections of trail 
along the, the PCT, like Tahoe Rim Trail, they have 50 miles that they work on maintaining. Or we work with groups like uh, Washington Trails Association where they uh, go to assigned projects, um, different projects each year. And we work out a program of work with, with Washington Trails Association and they recruit volunteers to come work on the trail. And then in addition to those stewardship programs, we also internally have clubs or chapters that we have, um, I think we maybe have about 13 of those groups now up and down the trail that are geographically centralized. And so for instance, out of the Portland area, the greater Portland area, we have a chapter called the Mount Hood chapter and that's several hundred people who go out and do maintenance. Um, they do a lot of day projects, they do weekend projects. And these folks have adopted sections of trail, the chapters committed to adopting 240 miles of trail, but then within that chapter, there's individuals who go out and they commit to adopting five miles of trail or two miles of trail. And they go out and do the annual maintenance on those sections. And if there's a project that's larger than what they can tackle, our staff will help organize a larger project um, and bring in volunteers from uh, across the trail or from across the country to do maybe a week long or a 10 day project, depending on the specific needs of the, of the area and the technical work that they're doing. Um, but again, we have groups all up and down the trail um, that offer those projects from Southern California all the way up to the North Cascades. You can see here on this slide that Randy put up, our um, organization is broken down uh, into six geographical areas. And so we have a staff person, a regional representative for each of those six um, areas of the trail. And so th those staff people are responsible for organizing everything that happens in, in their section related to maintenance. The staff people are looking out for protection issues on the trail. So if somebody wants to build a pipeline or a hang glider launch pad, or they wanna reintroduce grizzly bears, that's gonna affect the trail. Um, our local staff person will um, work with the agencies to minimize the impact to the tra trail. Um, they also get volunteers engaged in those protection efforts when needed um, to, to expand our capacity to advocate for protecting the trail. Um, so we do have, as I said, our, our stewardship group, our program is very large. Last year uh, on the PCT, there were 118,000 hours of service. Um, that's from the PCTA volunteers, as well as all of our partner volunteers doing work on the trail. Um, but also doing work in programs like visitor use management that I mentioned. Uh, Ther Teresa touched on this a little bit related to the CDT. Um, we, we have um, volunteers who are going out and doing campsite inventories where campsites pop up, where they're, they're not, people are not supposed to be camping. Um, we have volunteers who go out and measure and take GPS coordinates of those campsites. And then we monitor those over time using volunteers we also have a new program that we started maybe two years ago where we have trailhead hosts. So volunteers who are located at specific trailheads and they're providing information to hikers, whether they're day hikers, section hikers, or again, long distance hikers. Um, and we do have uh, partner groups that do that, get engaged in that work as well. So um, uh, we have Friends of Desolation Wilderness uh, in Central California who help with that. Uh, up in Wash or Oregon, excuse me, there's a couple of groups that are helping us with our visitor use management programs. So there's a lot of different ways that we uh, can work with other partners to do stewardship as in trail maintenance, but also in our volunteer and, and public education piece. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to mention one of our large programs within uh, volunteer stewardship is our Trail Skills College program. And we offer a number of trainings up and down the trail every year through through what we call Trail Skills College. And those are either day long uh, trainings or up to a three day um, long weekend training event where we might offer over 40 classes over the course of a weekend. Anything from intro to trail maintenance, um, all the way up to uh, crew leadership, um, how to build new trail, how to decommission trail. And then also we do offer um, saw certification, chainsaw and first aid certification. We were one of the first trail groups in the country to have a standalone program recognized by the Forest Service where we're authorized to utilize volunteers to train and certify other volunteers. That's one of the key um, pieces to my work is helping the Forest Service um, with their saw policy and understand the role of our groups uh, 
as partners and stewards of public lands to help them leverage their capacity um, with SAW training. So um, we're very happy to offer those programs. Um, when we have those training events, first and foremost, we open them up to PCT volunteers, but then if there's any spots left, we open them to the public. So any of your wilderness stewardship groups could take part uh, and fill those open spots that we have left. Um, so I think that covers all the questions that you had, uh, had wanted us to cover in the intro, Randy. All right, thanks, Jennifer. So the, you've heard about the three scenic trails. Let's um, change and talk about the rest of the National Scenic and Historic Trail System. So Chelsea, you want to take it away? Okay, thanks so much. Uh, so again, my name is Chelsea Bodemer, and I represent the Partnership for the National Trail System. So as you can see on the screen here, this is a map of the National Scenic and Historic Trails. As I mentioned earlier, they cover uh, 55,000 miles. Uh, and Randy, if you want to go to the next slide. Great. Okay, so the um, mission of our organization is to empower, inspire, and strengthen public and private partners to develop, preserve, promote, and sustain the National Scenic and Historic Trails. So we have been around for over 20 years, which is pretty exciting. Um, our headquarters is in Madison, Wisconsin. I work remotely from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. As you can see, I'm in my office today. Um, and we work, or the way that we're structured is that we have um, membership groups, affiliate groups, and soon-to-be supporters. So we're launching our supporter program this year. So we have 34 member groups, and the qualification for a member group is um, that you are the primary partner with the federal agencies and manage uh, one or more of the National Scenic or Historic Trails. And you can see all of our member organizations here. The qualifications to be an affiliate member of the partnership is that you're an organization that is involved with supporting one National Scenic or Historic Trail or the entire National Trail System. So uh, like the Tahoe Rim Association is a partner, American Hiking Society, or I'm sorry, an affiliate, American Hiking Society is another affiliate. Uh, the Backcountry Horsemen and Women of America are an affiliate. And so we're, um, we're more or less an umbrella organization, so to say. So we work with all these different partners and some of the services that we're able to offer are um, providing a collective voice when it comes to advocacy. So each year we travel to Washington DC for our Hike the Hill event. This year, I wanna say we had, oh, I don't know, 40 or 50 partner organizations um, that attended and we all went together to the Hill to advocate for similar causes um, as they pertain to national trails and public lands as a whole. Uh, so some of the partner or some of the projects that we've worked on specifically with our uh, member and affiliate partners, um, and perhaps Jen can speak to this, but uh, we worked together collectively to revise the US Forest Service SAW policy um, which now allows for trainings to be transferable for chainsaw and cross-cut saw use across um, the different forest service lands. We also worked uh, collectively on the Forest Service Trail Stewardship Act, which is designed to help authorize more funding and activities for volunteerism to occur on national forest. And we worked with the U.S. Forest Service on their National Trails Policy and Tenure Challenge which is aimed to help create a culture of collaboration within the US Forest Service, to help bring more resources from outside the Forest Service to help with the stewardship of trails. And this mostly relates to volunteers. Um, another thing to note, just to backtrack for a second, is that we do, um, the scenic and historic trails cross through 90 national forests. So a point of interest there. And let me see what our next, Okay, yeah, if you wanna to go to the next slide, actually, Randy, that would be great. So one of the best ways to get involved in thinking about um, how to partner with our organization is one, to become an affiliate member, depending on the work you do. Um, but also, if you go to our website and you go to the drop down for national trails, you can go to by state. And if you click on a state, it will actually give you the different trail organizations. So when we looked at the member groups, um, this will give you the member groups based on the state that you live in. And so we work on a national level with these organizations. However, many of these organizations have local chapters. So by doing this, you can see what organizations are in your state. And then, of course, on the website, you can see what the local chapters are. And that's a great way to work together um, and see what projects might overlap or how organizations such as yours and these um, chapters within these uh, national organizations can work together 
on Forest Service land. I'm trying to think what else to cover here. So again, the big work that we do, uh, we work collectively for Voice for Advocacy. We do um, information sharing, such as webinars. So today we're uh, doing this webinar in conjunction with the National Wilderness Stewardship Alliance. And we do um, some webinars outside of these collaborative webinars as well. Um, one of the, the big goals of our organization is to share best practices, right? So how can we get, say, um, you know, Jen on the West Coast and Andrew on the East Coast to share the incredible information that they have with one another, but not only with one another, but with the whole National Trails community as a whole, as they represent scenic and historic trails. And so um, within our organization, we have some committees. So we have an advocacy and policy committee, which is an example of that information sharing. Um, we have a membership committee, which is more internal, and then we have a volunteer committee as well, which is representatives from the different organizations that share best practices on um, volunteer management, volunteer recruitment, and uh, things of the sort. So I think that's the basic gist okay. as we get into questions. Hopefully I can provide more information. Yeah, thank you, Chelsea. And thanks all of our panelists um, for the great introductions about the National Scenic and Historic Trail System. So with that, we have some pointed questions that we're going to ask our panelists because our focus today is trying to better understand how the local organizations can interact with a long distance trail organization. So let's just go ahead and we'll start again east to west um, with Andrew. So what types of training does your organization provide that a local organization can participate in? And I know Jen already mentioned one, but what are some others? And we'll just go quickly, Andrew, Teresa, Jennifer, and Chelsea. Well, um, there's the kind of core trail design, construction, and maintenance skills. Um, and that's, you know, digging side hill, that's, um, you know, rock work and, and all the kind of uh, harder skills. And we have a number of different ways for local organizations to interface with those. Um, that's the prime, that's the... What? So what specific training um, programs, I mean, what training opportunities do you provide? What, what are the dates and um, the, the types of activities that, are, that people can participate with? Um, I'm not sure I understand the difference in the question. We have all those trainings. They are offered and posted on our website. Um, we also work through our local trail clubs to advertise those trainings in the community um and again they are on you know a, a pretty wide spectrum of topics okay so go to the website and look to see the types of training that are available covering a wide range of topics yeah and i would also engage in the low with the local trail club um you know i live in roanoke the roanoke appalachian trail club has uh, about four or 500 members and has a large community presence. You know, they have their own network of partnerships and some of those partners um, request trainings, which then kind of come to us and we provide the Roanoke Club with, whether it's the local garden club or a Boy Scout troop or something like that, uh, along with um, kind of larger groups um, that, that they network with. Okay. Uh, are any of them coming up soon that people could sign up for? I'm sure they are. <laughs> I have no idea um, what the training schedule is right now. I can look on the website. Okay. Um, but, you know, again, most of the trainings are tailored to the needs of our clubs um, because we have a lot of clubs and, uh, and those clubs have a pretty large footprint. So you may also look at the website uh, of each individual club, and you can get to those uh, club websites through our uh, AppalachianTrail.org, and that would be another way. You know, they advertise their trainings. We're the kind of contractor um, for to provide the trainings. Okay, Teresa, how about Continental Divide Trail? Hi. <clears throat> yeah, so we actually do several trainings. Most of our programs are around the Adopt-A-Trail program. And so we um, host, I think last year, we did five to six trainings along the trail. And, and a lot of times they're associated with other partners and also with our gateway community. So we try to bring the trainings to the volunteers that we're actually trying to get out on the trail. Um, we'll do the same this year. And then 
I think we're going to start expanding our programs to include a lot more um, components that go along with that adopted trail training. So that will include things like first aid, CPR, as well as, you know, eventually we'll start moving into higher level skills around chainsaw training or, or crosscut saw training, um, other kinds of specialty skills. I think we'll also, um, we have a lot of resources for our volunteers because of the Blaze of CDT program last year to sign everything on the CDT, where um, we have a great training module that's online for signing for not just adopters, but pretty much any volunteer. And then we work a lot with other partners to provide other kind of trainings, as Andrew was saying, we work a lot with volunteers for Outdoor Colorado who have already this sort of outdoor leadership or outdoor stewardship institute set of, of um, curriculums that we don't need to necessarily reinvent the wheel, uh, which is great because then we can partner together to provide those resources. I think what we have learned and what we try to do is mostly bring our trainings to the volunteers along the trail versus in, um, requiring volunteers to travel to us just because out here in the Rocky Mountain West, it's very uh, we have a lot of miles, <laughs> and so um, so we'll start, I think, adding more to our suite of programs in the future. But um, for our programs, you can go to our website, um, which is continentaldividetrail.org under volunteer, and um, you can find how not just the trainings, but our other volunteer programs. Are, we, have, we host between 10 and 12 volunteer projects along the trail that are active, whether they be maintenance or construction projects. Um, and then our partners also host projects along the CDT, and you can link to all of those through our website. And our field season doesn't really start until the end of April. I think our first training is in Silver City, New Mexico, in either early, I think it's early May, like the first week of May. Um, and then we sort of are on hold until about June because of the, obviously the Continental Divide Trail is about, is under at Wolf Creek Pass right now, 400 inches of snow. And so therefore, um, we can't really access it until probably July. So most of our trainings take place um, on the trail. Um, and so therefore they will happen later on in the summer and then go through the fall. Hey, Randy, can I, can I jump in real quick? Yeah. One, one, one important point is there, the differences among our, these um, four organizations and, and primarily ATC, PCTA and CDTC that are on here and how, how they take a different approach to empowering volunteers. There's not a lot of volunteers that, our programs aren't set up for volunteers to volunteer directly with ATC on, mm -hmm. the, on the ground. Um, we, have, we have maybe one or two programs that are like that, but the vast majority of volunteers who find themselves on the AT uh, work through one of our 31 local trail clubs and um, all the agreements um, that those local trail clubs maintain with their agency partners. ATC um, serves to empower those trail clubs to provide the direct volunteer services for the AT. And you can kind of keep them all on the same page. Whereas I think as what Jennifer will, will um, talk about here, there's more volunteers that go straight through PCTA Right, um, and, and, and so they provide that training directly, and it, it's kind of a mixed bag from what I understand with the CDTC. Right. So it's, it's a couple different models at play here, um, and, and I think that's an important point. All right, so yeah, Jennifer, how is it the same or different on the PCT? Um, as Andrew mentioned, we, we administer a lot of our volunteer um, programs directly. Um, we also do, as I mentioned, partner with groups like Washington Trails Association. Um, but by far, in our, with our training programs, if you want to get involved, as I mentioned, we, we do have our Trail Skills College program. If you go to our website um, and click on volunteer, there's a big button at the top that says volunteer. There's donate and volunteer. Go to that volunteer button and there is a huge drop down menu of resources. You'll find a button just for the for the Trail Skills College and that lists all of the training dates that we have coming up for this year. And we do start our training, our, I think our first training is actually next weekend. Um, we are under several hundred inches of snow in most places on the trail, um, but we do utilize other trails and lower elevation in the off season so we can get the training done and started now so when the snow melts on the PCT the volunteers are ready to get out so um, and our trainings go all the way through usually November down in Southern California but again all the dates are listed there as well as our SAW certifications the other 
unique resource that we have is all of our training material is available to you online. Uh, anybody, the general public, can go to our website and find all of our training curriculum. You're welcome to download it. You're welcome to use it. Um, you don't need written permission. You don't need to call us and ask. We, we appreciate a little shout out if you use it or to know that you're going to use it. But all, all of our course materials there, what your instructors would need to know, what the students need to know. And we've developed this in partnership with the Forest Service. And so it meets Forest Service guidelines. So that's a resource for you, um, uh, other organizations. Please feel free to use it. All of our um, volunteer stewardship forms um, that we use all of the release forms, all of the aids for our crew leaders. All of that material is available on our website for free. And um, any wilderness stewardship group or trail group is welcome to use any of those forms that are posted online. You can download them, just swap out our logo with your logo. They're free for you guys to use and take. Um, we do update them usually about once a year to keep them current with agency requirements, um, primarily forest service requirements. And then I would also add that on that volunteer page, there's a place where you can sign up for our volunteer emails. You'll find out about volunteer opportunities that we're offering, that our partner groups are offering, as well as any of the training events that we have. We um, send out hundreds of emails a year. Don't We won't flood your email box. They go to different, different groups um, with different topics. But if you're interested, you can sign up. You can um, put in a geographic requirement. We ask if you're interested in a certain area of the trail. Um, so please uh, take a look at that and sign up for that. You'll learn about the opportunities. Um, and then if you're, um, I might be jumping a little bit ahead here, but if your wilderness stewardship group is interested in adopting either a section of the PCT or one of the main connector trails, we can provide you um, training for your uh, volunteers and your stewards so that you know what the PCT standards are and what we're looking for. But um, we will provide that training to other organizations who are adopters. And then the last piece of training that I would, uh, advice that I would just offer um, is not necessarily from one of our groups, but just remember that if you are a partner of the Forest Service, that occasionally they have openings on their trainings. And so if you um, hold a volunteer agreement with the Forest Service, it doesn't hurt to ask if they have an opening at their first aid and CPR or at their crosscut saw training. Um, sometimes they do, and they'll keep you in mind if they know you're interested. Okay, great, thank you. Chelsea, do you have any training um, opportunities you want to mention from the partnership? And then I want to get into a, a double question and then move to the questions that uh, folks are asking. Yeah, so I think the big training opportunity with the partnership would be uh, we have a biennial conference. So we just had one in Vancouver, Washington in October of last year, and we're working out the location for our next conference. But um, so we consider it a, a conference in training per se. It's a great opportunity to network and learn from other nonprofit organizations as well as federal agency uh, folks as well. And it's also an opportunity for, for us to learn from you. So we will put out um, a request for proposals prior to our next conference. And if you guys are interested in learning more about our conference and training on our website, you can sign up for our e-newsletter list. And um, I am just going to, someone asked a question that I'm, I'm going to bring up right now because it's pertinent to what Teresa said. And um, Teresa, can you just speak a little bit more to what a gateway community is? Sure. Um, so CDTC has worked with, we, we recognize that unlike on the East and West Coast, the CDT we, we, um, traverses along pretty remote sections of the Rocky Mountain West. And so outside of Denver, we don't have a lot of <clears throat> larger population bases. So we sort of realized that we had an opportunity to engage with some local communities, um, many of which, even though the CDT walks right down Main Street, for some of them, weren't aware that the CDT was actually a trail they could access. And so, or what, what the whole thing was about. They just, on occasion, because there were only 25 few hikers up until five years ago, would see these really weird people walking through town. And so they were kind of really disconnected from it. And so we took a long, a long, vision strategy that if we could engage with local communities along the CDT, first to create awareness, second to create um, not just awareness about the trail, but awareness of the opportunities that the trail provided them as, as basically an economic driver for their local communities as a part of the assets they offered um, as a community, not just for CDT hikers, but for the region they might reside in. And then third, as a long-term goal to sort of 
engage local volunteers in the actual stewardship and management um, and administration of the CDT through our Adopt a Trail program. So we're in a very formative stage of that that final piece, but working with those local communities like Silver City, New Mexico, or Grants, New Mexico, or Helena, Montana, or Salmon, Idaho, um, go, working with them to kind of put them through a designation process where they actually, as a community, have to initiate the process. They actually ask us to, to, to support them. We don't go into those communities and say, you should be a gateway community. This is how you do it. It's more like, we have this program. If you're interested, let us know. And we'll, we'll support you creating your own profile of how you want to, to become a gateway community or recognize as a gateway community. And then we go through a designation process and it can be anywhere from two weeks to two years, depending on the community. And through that process, they identify who they are, what they want to provide, what kind of resources they want to grow. But the most important part is they do the work internally as a community to, to get the buy-in of their local governments or um, whatever their, their governing body is, whether it's a county commissioner or a, a com, uh, um, the actual mayor, depending on <clears throat> how communities are organized and, and how they wanna represent themselves. And then we work with them to sort of become designated. We actually have a, a formal proclamation and all these other kind of aspects that go along with it. And then we build those relationships with those gateway communities to not just see how they can actually present who they are as a, as a gateway community to the folks visiting the CDT, but how they can use then the CDT to help market other assets in their community. So if, like, for example, in Silver City, um, they use the CDT, they, they are the gateway to the CDT in some ways, but they're also the gateway to the Gila River, they're the gateway to the Aldo Leopold Wilderness, or they're also, you can come into Silver City and one day go mountain biking, one day go hiking, one day go fly fishing, another day just hang out, eat some really great food, and visit all the local artisan shops. So that's how they sort of frame their communities. And then for us, we also, we've, we've held held probably for the last three or four years adopt a trail trainings and now the entire CDT around Silver City is adopted by local volunteers we're actually meeting that stewardship mission so for us it's it's a long range um, program that's really yeah, um, garnered towards getting volunteers to steward the CDT but it starts a lot of times in just creating awareness of that that there's an opportunity like the hook of the CDT to those local communities and then growing together with that community to help them identify who and how they want to represent themselves to the potential users of the CDT. Okay, great. So I have one more question I'm going to ask the panel and then we're going to move into participant questions. So real quickly, one minute or less, are there any events upcoming that local groups can be involved in on your trail? And do you have any sort of funding opportunities that, that local groups can apply for, for assistance to help in, in and around your area? So let's just yeah. go again, Andrew. So there's, there, I mean, there's probably events, um, especially in the spring, uh, up and down the AT, look at a local trail club um, and their website for more information there. But I'll go straight into funding because that might be more. Uh, pertinent. The ATC d directly administers a number of grant programs that get right back out um, in the field. A lot of those grant programs are around the Appalachian Trail Specialty License Tag Program. So there's revenue sharing license tags in Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, Virginia, and Pennsylvania, I believe now. Um, I'm not sure if there's a grant program about Pennsylvania yet. Um, but in the South, each one of those uh, states has a revenue sharing grant program that clubs, that volunteers, that partners can apply to. Um, we also administer a grant program through a partnership with L.L. Bean um, that is generally focused on um, tools, equipment, and capacity for our local trail clubs. So those are the um, primary funding sources that we directly administer um, for some of our um, partners. All right, great. Teresa? So we currently right now don't have any um, funding opportunities yet, but that is our goal down the road that we can help provide with small micro grants to some of our partners. But one thing we do is with partner organizations, for example, like uh, with VOC, we a lot of times can provide uh, the funding for food for the volunteer projects if we're doing partner projects, if they can provide staff from their side. So we try to partner in a way that we bring funding to the table um, directly. Um, and then um, 
and I, well, I, I think I'll leave it with that because we have a lot of events coming up and down the CDT. Our big event is going to be the last weekend of April in Silver City, New Mexico, our huge trail days event. And um, while we, again, don't, it's not the size of, say, maybe the AT's uh, Damascus trail days, we don't actually want that. It's a much more community-based event. And um, we're looking forward to having that um, be another success for this year. All right, great. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I would just say for events, there are a huge number of events on the PCT. Go to our website and look at the events page for non-trail maintenance related events. That's the best way. And then regarding funding, um, we don't offer a granting program, but if your organization was interested in doing a project on the PCT, um, we could help you with access to our extensive tool caches. Um, we do have a lot of specialty tools that we use and can provide to uh, stewardship groups. And then we are, if we know well enough in advance and we have the ability um, to organize with you, we usually are able to offer some support to offset the cost of food uh, for volunteer projects. And so that's um, one of the benefits of partnering with us and kind of being in our regular cycle um, as one of our regular clubs or stewardship groups is the ability for us to budget um, for your projects for food. All right, great. Chelsea, did you have any? Yeah, so we don't have any specific events other than the conference that we have. But if you go to our website, we do have an events calendar that speaks to the conference and also uh, trail, the events held by trail-related organizations. Um, as far as funding goes, we don't have any funding opportunities at the moment. But um, again, I do encourage you guys to go to our website and look for the partner groups that are within your state because they may have some funding opportunity, opportunities that you can utilize. Okay, great. We have one question that's come in um, asking if the long distance trail reps would speak to the, the what they view as the current most significant threat to wilderness on their respective trails and how partner groups can be engaged in addressing those threats. This, this is Teresa and I'm going to go first because I'm going to have to pop off real quick. Here, I have to go to another meeting, but um, I will just say that the thing that we see, even though we have such low use along the CDT, is that one of the biggest issues is how we're going to deal with the amount of use that's coming. So, you know, we've done such a good job of promoting the trail through social media and various things that the people coming to, in particular things like wilderness areas, not just our general forest areas, are not as skilled as they have been in the past. And so we, we're starting to see a lot more impacts. And I think we constantly battle, and, and we talked a lot about this with our uh, Blazing the CDT project, where now that we've signed it, we've kind of increased the use artificially to some extent. And while we want people using our long distance trails, we're recognizing that they don't necessarily have the skills that we traditionally would hope they would have to come. And so the potential for impact is great. And it's kind of that whole adage, you build it and they will come. How are you gonna deal with that? And I, I don't know that we have any good answers, but I, but I know we're grappling with the question. Okay. Andrew, you're on mute. Muted no longer. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll classify that. I don't know if, if the um, person asking the question was more interested in threats to wilderness character or threats to wilderness um, designation or, or wilderness protection, but I can kind of answer those um, together. You know, I, we, we definitely see threats to wilderness character through um, changes in visitation, not only is, and then Teresa mentioned this, not only increased visitation, but also the types of visitation. So how skilled a person is in the back country, how self-reliant a person is in the back country, and that sort of thing. Um, I think as um, populations grow, as uh, the AT um, becomes uh, even more iconic in a way, uh, if that's possible, the, those those level of um, and access becomes easier then um, those types of threats to wilderness character I think um, are real and and we manage that through education programs we manage that through a lot of kind of soft and passive management how we design trailheads and infrastructure um, and that sort of thing um, we also you know work a lot with our partners to look at other opportunities uh, in the um, public land recreation system that are outside of wilderness that might provide a similar experience to the AT, but not actually on the AT. Um, and we do that a lot with uh, organized groups and commercial use and that sort of thing, which we try to keep off of the AT um, in general as much as we can. 
Now, threats to uh, the wilderness preservation system. Um, I, you know, I think the, the wilderness is a, um, it, you know, is, is the biggest, you know, part of the wilderness. The threat is the, the success of the wilderness preservation system. There's a lot of wonderful um, big tracts of land with unique and distinct character that's very attractive to a lot of different user groups. And um, as we all know that the um, wilderness was preserved for a specific uh, suite of interest as identified uh, in the Wilderness Act. And that always doesn't um, jive with how people uh, like to recreate outside. And so uh, one, one of the things that we try to do is educate people on the value of wilderness kind of as is and how that um, preserves you know, not only a suite of recreation opportunities that are that are quickly dwindling, but also preserves land um, for its own intrinsic value and, and why that's important. Uh, so education, it, it, it kind of solves those, or we address those problems uh, with education, whether or not it solves them, I think is a different question. All right, thank you, Jennifer. Um, for the sake of time, I'm just gonna echo what Teresa and Andrew already um, commented on. Um, it's I don't want to I don't want to start on it because I could probably talk for another 10 minutes on it. So I'll just echo them and let, let you go to a wrap up, Randy. OK, thank you very much. OK, so we want to thank everybody for uh, participating in today's mm -hmm. webinar. We want to thank our esteemed panel. Um, thank you for all the work you're doing on our long distance and historic trails. The scenic and national historic trails are the foundation of our national trail system. And so thank you again for your time today and for sharing with our audience how they can participate with you in helping to uh, protect and preserve uh, wilderness where these trails are going. I just wanted to share that in the month, a couple months ahead, we have three um, upcoming webinars that you might be interested in. April 9th, we'll be working with Cornell University, uh, their ornithology department, to talk about a crowdsource um, app, phone app, where you can participate with your organization in bird identification and bird surveys to build a national database. In May, we have Jennifer Brandt from the Latino Conservation Hispanic Access Foundation is going to talk about Latino Conservation Week, how your organization can um, use that as an opportunity to reach out to um, those that are different than most of us in the Hispanic community. And then on June 11th, we'll be working with the National Environmental Education Foundation, uh, Tony Richardson, talking about National Public Lands Day and how your organization can build local awareness and interest in support of public national, pu national Public Lands Day with events and some of the funding opportunities that exist as well as other support material that will allow you to build a volunteer uh, day around the National Public Lands Day. So again, we wanna thank everybody for participating. Uh, we wanna thank you for your support of wilderness and the National Wilderness Preservation System. And with that, we are going to, um, oh, Andrew? Yeah, I just, wanna, I just wanna say one other thing that I forgot to mention is that if you're interested okay. in executing a crew program, um, a lot of other organizations, partner organizations, have come to participate in our flagship program, the Conorock Trail Crew, um, to learn about uh, crew operations and volunteer engagement in a kind of hands-on way. And if anybody's interested in that um, or anything else, I, I welcome an email or a phone call. It's easy to find me through our website. Okay. Well, with that, we're going to go ahead and close out this meeting. Thanks, everybody, for participating. Hope to see you in April for our next webinar. Thanks, panel.